my welcome to our study of the book of Matthew. This is called Follow Me because it's all about discipleship. And the word disciple means to, to be a follower of somebody else. That's what the book of Matthew is all about. So we are studying the book of Matthew, taking a close look at Jesus so that we might be motivated by his words and actions and his sacrifice. We might be motivated to follow him. These last few chapters, we have been reading through this book. It's called Follow Me, Discipleship According to the Book of Matthew. It's written by Martin Franzman, a seminary professor from Lutheran Seminaries. And <clears throat> we've been seeing in the last few chapters that Jesus is instilling in his followers, both the disciples in the book and you and me, he's been instilling in us a certain hope, uh, an eye toward the future that's all about Jesus. The past few chapters have also shown us that a lot of the contemporaries of the original disciples, the leaders of the Jerusalem church, the people who inhabited Israel at Jesus' time, a lot of them did not have their future eye focused on Jesus. And so they were mixed up. They thought that a Messiah would come to save them from earthly trouble. They thought that maybe no Messiah would come. They thought that maybe there was no resurrection from the dead. They thought that maybe uh, the way to ensure a happy future is perfectly obey all the laws. Jesus comes to, to show us that that's wrong. All of people's hopes, their ideas for a good future are incorrect. And he wants us to focus our hope on him. That really comes to the forefront in our study today, Matthew chapter 24. It is maybe the toughest chapter in possibly in the entire Bible to interpret. It is uh, certainly a chapter that focuses us on the hope and the goal of Christian faith because it's all about the end of the world. Jesus is explaining ultimately what our hope is about, ultimately where we cast our eye on the future, the end of the world as we know it, this age with this nature and these people, and we look forward to the next world where Jesus is going to be the king recognized by all. Of course, we sometimes call that heaven. It's about the end of the world, but it's also about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's not so mysterious. We know a lot about the destruction of Jerusalem. It happened in 70 AD. The Romans came and they sacked the city. They burned it down. Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. And Jesus doesn't see them as two separate events. He teaches them like this, all blended together, which is why it's one of the toughest chapters in the entire Bible to interpret. For example, we're going to see this later on. Jesus says, Everybody who's living in this generation will see what I'm talking about. Oh, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Everybody who heard him say that would hear about the destruction of Jerusalem. But then he also says in the same chapter, Matthew 24, no one knows the hour or the day at which this will come. Well, that must be about the end of the world. Because I do know when Jerusalem was destroyed, but I do not know when the end of the world is coming. Jesus blends these two things together because guess what? He's got a very specific goal in mind for his teaching about the end of the world. People seem to be fascinated by the end of the world. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you what Jesus wants us to know about it. But first, let's just kind of warm up our brains by, by talking about our first discussion question. This is a time when it's great to grab a piece of paper, a pencil, a paper Bible if you want to read through some stuff later on. Um, but but we're going to want something to take notes on or some people to discuss with so that you can discuss this question. Number one, list some reasons people are interested in the end of the world conversations. List some reasons that people are interested in the end of the world conversations. I have a hunch that a lot of people are intrigued by that. People love to study the end of the world. They love to predict the end of the world. They love to uh, look for the end of the world. Pause the video, discuss or take some notes on some reasons why people are interested in the end of the world conversations. <laughs> Perhaps you said people just want to know what's coming. 
the unknown future is kind of scary and people want to know what's coming. Perhaps you said people are fascinated by the fantastical language that the Bible uses to describe the end of the world. Revelation has a lot of crazy imagery. Uh, even this section that we're going to read today has some uh, moving images of what the world will look like and be like. Some people are just afraid, right? They're just afraid um, of the end of the world and so they, they want to talk about it. I suppose some people maybe say it gives them ability to seem like they're in the know. Like they have some secret knowledge that they know that other people don't know when they talk about the end of the world. Those are all reasons people are interested in the end of the world. And unfortunately, Jesus doesn't really address any of those things. He doesn't help us know when it's coming. He doesn't give us any secret inside info. In fact, most of the information Jesus gives us about the end of the world, he's getting from the Old Testament. We'll see a little bit of that. Here's why Jesus teaches us about the end of the world. So that we know how to live now. That's the truth. Jesus teaches us about the end of the world so that we know how to live now. Uh, in the book of Peter, in 2 Peter, um, Peter says that what kind of people ought we be? What kind of lives ought we live as we look forward to Jesus coming? That's what Jesus is getting at. Peter learned that from Jesus. Jesus wants us to consider what kind of people should we be now if we know that our hope is coming in Jesus. That's what we're going to discover. And uh, in this first section that we're going to read it is from uh, Luke, or Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 34. Uh, 1 through 35, verses 1 through 35. Um, we are going to see Jesus describe what the end of the world is going to be like. You're going to see those words on the next screen, but if you'd rather read them online, you can click the link below here where you can, uh, uh, below the video, you can see a link where you can read it online. You can also read it in your paper Bible, um, but you will see the words on the next screen um, if you'd like to do that. There's also video links below where you can see what I think is a really moving image of the city of Jerusalem and the teaching of Jesus. Um, those are also linked below. So we'll head into the first part of Matthew chapter 24, looking to learn what sort of people we ought to be from Matthew 24, 1 through 35. In Matthew chapter 24, we have these two subjects, the destruction of the temple and the signs that point to the end times. And Jesus is trying to use both of those teaching points to certain our hope, to make our hope certain about what is coming. Notice that our outlook towards the future is not escapism. It's not, uh, we just need to get out of here and avoid the present reality. It's all about fulfilling our duties even here. It's not uh, an attempt to say that the bad things of life aren't real. We're going to hear about really bad things that happen in this life. But our hope is to stay focused on Jesus no matter what goes on around us, whether the temple crumbles around the origin of disciples, or whether the world endures much hardship as it will at the end times. Here's how Jesus taught about it. He was leaving the temple. There were these huge stones around them that were formed the foundation of the temple. And he says this in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him uh, to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Okay, so here you can tell Jesus is obviously talking about the literal temple. Um, he's talking about the destruction of the temple. Um, that would come in about 70 AD as uh, the Romans would come, Titus, and, and they would sack Rome or sack uh, Jerusalem and they would destroy the temple, burn it. There's horrific descriptions of that in some of the ancient historians, Josephus, etc. And uh, Jesus is predicting that. Verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So notice who makes the connection between the temple being destroyed in Jerusalem and Jesus coming at the end? It's the disciples. They hear this about the temple being destroyed and they ask, when will this happen? Obviously pointing back there. And he says, well, and then they say, what will be the sign of your coming? See, the disciples have linked these two events in their brain. Why? 
It's because of what Jesus said. If you go back to uh, chapter 23, what we studied last week, and you look at the last thing Jesus said, Jesus said about Jerusalem, he was mourning that they rejected her. And the last two verses, verses 38 and 39, he says, look, your house is left to you desolate. So the disciples are interpreting, and I think correctly, that Jesus, when he said the house in Jerusalem is God's house in Jerusalem, the temple is desolate. It's destroyed. It's vacant. He's saying when the temple is destroyed, um, and then Jesus said, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they're seeing the coming of Jesus at the same time or in the same thing, same category as the desolation of Jerusalem and its temple. Now, Jesus set them up to understand that. And Jesus is going to talk about that, about those two events without really ever distinguishing them. And it's because he wants us to know the main point. The main point of the temple being destroyed is the same as the main point of what's going to happen before Jesus comes back at the end of the world. The main point is that we would live our lives with the hope of Jesus, with looking forward to Jesus and not get distracted by all the other things. So that's what Jesus talks about. When they ask him, what will be the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming of the temple? And Jesus answers them, watch out that no one deceives you. So Jesus' concern is obviously not that they could predict the future. Jesus' concern is that they would Stay focused on him. Don't be deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of, okay, we're going to start a list here. Wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus is telling us about the end of the world and what will happen in what, what you could call secular history. All right. The secular history, I mean, not what happens in the church, but what happens in kingdoms. He says all of history is rolling out the red carpet for Jesus. Or maybe it's better to say it, they're blowing their trumpets to announce the coming of Jesus. If Jesus has some sort of imperial march like uh, hail to the chief, um, the tune of it is dark and sad. It is the tragedies of the world that announce the coming of Jesus. And the disciples are supposed to interpret all that to keep themselves sober, to keep themselves alert, to stop them from falling in love with this world, to stop them from being obsessed with the messiahs who claim that they can fix everything on this earth. They won't. They can't. And so God has peppered the history of the world with war and nations taking against nations and famines and earthquakes. All these tragic things God allows in part because he is announcing our need for him, we desire Jesus to come back. Uh, we, we pray about that. We pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly because we want Jesus to come and, and help us. So what does Jesus want the disciples to do? Well, he doesn't want them to be fearful, right? He says, uh, don't be alarmed. You are not to be alarmed. He says, you're not supposed to just run around with your hair on fire because the world is a mess. That's how some people react. Instead, they can handle this with composure. They know that these are birth pains. They, they know that these are birth pains. You know, when a, a woman goes into labor, it, it's painful. And uh, one of the things that gets them through is they're looking forward to the joy that comes at the end. And, and so you can endure a lot more pain if you know there is happiness at the end. And that is what Jesus says to us. Endure the hardships of this world with a level head because you know the joy that's coming. All these terrible things are steps on the path that lead to the day when God will come and rescue his people. He will take away our, our pain and he will give us lasting joy. Second question for you. It's about the secular history. Give examples of worldly tragedies that cause people to put their hope in God. 
The assertion is that some people, when they see worldly tragedies, they will uh, fix their, their hope. They will stop putting their hope on worldly things. They will start putting their hope in God. Give some examples of that. Pause, discuss, jot some ideas down, and we'll come back with some answers. Well, interestingly enough, Jesus refers to a few of these in the Gospels. He talks about how uh, one time a tower fell over and crushed people who were working on it in the city of Siloam. Um, he talks about how Caesar killed people, or not Caesar, but Caesar's men killed people in the temple. Um, Pontius Pilate killed people in the temple as they were worshiping. And um, he said, these are there, not because the people were so evil and that's why God punished them, but they happened so that we would repent, so that we would put ourselves in a right relationship to God. Sometimes wars, um, I'm thinking of the current wars that are going on in our world. Um, you can see coverage of those on the news. Um, and, and those are there oftentimes. They cause people to pay attention to eternal things. Um, you think about famines. You think about uh, when people are short of water, when they're short of food. You think about the earthquakes. You could extend it to other natural disasters, uh, tsunamis and tornadoes. And, and when places are devastated, often they are forced to move on from their attachment to their homes or their families or their uh, you know, normal way of doing things on this earth and their traditions. They are forced to look for meaning in something else. And sometimes they put their meaning in God. You know, when Jesus talks about those tragedies, he also talks about how they cause us to repent, how to recognize that we participate in the evil of the world. And so um, he gives them to us to, to point us to our sin and see him as the solution rather than depending on humans as the solution to sin. Well, after Jesus talks a little bit about the regular secular consequences, he also talks about consequences in the church and for church people like us. That's in verse 9. Then you will be handed over and be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by nations. Here's the key, because of me. So people are persecuted and hated for all kinds of reasons. But here Jesus is talking about when that happens because we are following Jesus. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. Uh, that's probably a natural conclusion, right? You could come up with that on your own. But people will turn away when it gets hard. And they will betray each other and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So there's another sign. Um, false prophets and deceiving many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, so we've talked about the increase in secular wickedness, the increase in wickedness in the church. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So people will be half-hearted Christians. But then look at this awesome encouragement God gives us. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of saving, this gospel of salvation, uh, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You see, it's the history of the church that is a sign for followers of Jesus like you and me. Jesus doesn't paint this picture that, well, the world is bad, but inside the church it's beautiful and wonderful and great, and everybody should get along, and everything is going to be perfect. Everybody always agrees. No, he talks about hatred. Hatred from the world against Christians. If you ever have gotten really upset that the world does not appreciate Christian values more, just recognize Jesus was also warning us about that. He talks about divisions within the church. Uh, I sit across from my desk once in a while with, with people who are just distraught that people in God's church can't get along, that there are false teachings and multiple teachings on the same truth and, and how Catholics believe something different from Baptists who believe something different from you know other mainline denominations who believe something different from Lutherans and all of it is, is, is question marks for people. And Jesus warned us about that too. He says the church is going to be tested and, and it's going to be tried by fire. And, and the only way you make it out of this church mess, the only way you make it out with any hope intact is if your hope is in Jesus. If your hope is in the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus, that can't be shaken by division or by persecution. You know, there's been persecution and division in the church going all the way back to the first century. And some people have, have fallen away, just like Jesus predicted, and others have stayed in the faith. You know who stays in the faith? People who have their entire hope based in Jesus. And so the disciple has a composure. You get to have a composure amid all the alarms that are going off in the world and in the church. Not because you don't care that bad things are happening, but because 
You have your hope in Jesus, not in the church. You have your hope in Jesus, not in the world. You have your hope in Jesus, and so you work as hard as you can to help the world and help the church, all the while knowing that Jesus will make it work out in the end. Christ will, through his weak and suffering church, he, even though we are not very good at doing this and we don't always get along, Christ will use his church to make God's kingdom come. The gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. Got a third question for you. There's good news in the church, and there's bad news. Give an example of each, and then here's the uh, question at the end. Which one wins in the end? So I'm saying that in this section and in the world as you look around, you'll find some good things about church life, Christians, and you'll find some bad news. Give me an example of each, either from the Bible or from your life, and then talk about which one is more powerful, which one wins in the end, the good news or the bad news. Push pause, talk about it, write some things down, and we'll come back with answers. If I'm thinking about good news, I'm seeing this. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Whoever keeps their trust in Jesus is going to heaven. Wow, that's awesome. It means you don't have to do anything extraordinary. You don't have to do anything of your own merit. Just trust Jesus. You trust Jesus, you go to heaven. This gospel, that's good news. Undeserved love is coming your way. It's of Jesus' kingdom, that Jesus' kingdom is powerful. And it was is going to go out into the whole world. We're seeing that come true in our world. So in the text, it's that whoever believes is saved. It's that the gospel of the kingdom is preached. It's that it's going to the whole world. In real life, that good news looks like this. You are forgiven for Jesus' sake. In real life, you hear it every Sunday when you come to church. The good news about uh, the kingdom means this. No matter who's in charge of our world government, no matter how bad things get, no matter if there's great doctors or terrible doctors, great politicians or bad politicians, Jesus is the king of the world. We live in his kingdom. And the great news is that it's going out to the ends of the world. In our world, that looks like this. We've got missionaries all over the world in wells. We've got missionaries on every continent who are sharing the gospel. And the Christian church is bigger than just wells. We've got Christian missionaries, millions of people all over the world who share the gospel. You are one of them. You, in your little corner of the world, in your family, you get to tell people about the king of the world, Jesus, about anybody who believes is saved. But there's also bad news. Maybe uh, you looked at the bad news and you said many will turn away. You see that in real life, don't you? As people you love and family members you know turn away. You see false prophets is bad news. Um, a lot of people will uh, preach twisted truths. They will twist God's word. And a lot of people believe them. Um, maybe somebody's preaching the, the gospel just to get money. Or maybe somebody is um, abusing others uh, in the church. Uh, we hear reports of that and it's bad news. And as a result of that, the love of most will grow cold. So a, a lot of people won't believe in Jesus. That might make you think that in the end, the bad news wins. Um, but Jesus, I think, tips his hand that he says, in the end, the good news wins. I'm putting it in big, bold words down here. The good wins because Jesus says, in the end, the whole world will hear the gospel. In the end, whoever believes in Jesus will be saved. It's going to be sad for a lot of people, but not for you, because you believe in Jesus by the power of God's word. After Jesus talks about the uh, end of the world, how it will go for, uh, for the world, how it will go for the church, he transitions without any warning to talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So like I said, this happened in 70 AD. We pick it up in verse 15, and uh, here's, here's what Jesus says about the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, so when you see standing in the holy place, that's in the temple of God, right? The abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel. So Daniel uh, in verse in, in chapter nine of Daniel and chapter 11 and chapter 12, Daniel talked about this as a thing that would be horrible, this horrific thing that would happen inside the temple and it would cause people to, to lose their minds because it would desecrate the temple and it would be an abomination to the Lord. This abomination spoken through the prophet Daniel. When you see that happening in the temple, let the reader understand. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one go back into the, uh, in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great distress unequaled for from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Jesus is saying it is going to be this horrid, horrid thing um, that that will that will be in Jerusalem, um, and people will wish it never happened. If if you want to um, understand why he says don't even go back to get your coat, if you if you, if you're on the house, don't go back in. Um, why he says don't ever do that, and why it's terrible to be pregnant or nursing at that time. Um, you can read a little bit of the history. Um, if you Google Josephus, uh, let me write that out for you so, you so you got the spelling. Oh, shoot, I'm using the wrong thing. If you Google Josephus and then Jerusalem siege, you can... Uh, read his description of what happened. The Bible doesn't have a description of what happened, but Jesus, but the, but Josephus does. And, uh, it's not God's word. It's just secular history, but it is jarring what, uh, what he reports. The interesting thing to me is that Jesus didn't tell the disciples, oh, you should just fall in love with Jerusalem. He didn't tell the disciples, oh, this is going to be great. Um, this is God's city and his temple is here. So just get comfortable here. He spent the last few chapters pointing out how the leaders of Jerusalem, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law were wrong and the disciples couldn't be too attached to them. Jesus pointed out how Jerusalem was going to reject him, right? So he's, he's, he's saying they aren't going to put their, their full trust in me. And so they're doomed. He said at the end of chapter 38, right? Um, you will see your house left desolate because you rejected the son of man. Um, Jesus has been like, if you can picture the disciples had a, an emotional attachment, they were, they had heart strings attached to the temple and to Jerusalem. Jesus has been slowly snipping their attachment to God's city and God's temple because he doesn't want their hope to be pinned on a city or on their leaders or on their church or on their temple or on their sacrifices. He wants all their heart strings attached to Jesus, to him. And so Jesus has been slowly snipping the heartstrings that attached from the disciples' emotions onto the Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple because he knows what's going to happen to that temple. That temple won't last forever. If you go back there, you, you won't even see that temple standing. Instead, you will see the ruins of that temple. You won't see the Jerusalem that the, the disciples loved. You'll see a Jerusalem that's split between many world religions. You won't see Pharisees and Sadducees calling the shots. You will see all sorts of different leaders from all over, all different religions who are vying for control of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not a safe place to put your hope, but Jesus is. The Jesus who spoke these things was proven right in 70 AD, and the Jesus who spoke these things has been proven right about everything else. So, disciple, please attach your heartstrings to Jesus, not to this world, not to this city. And Jesus uh, transitions right there in verse 21. Um, he, he starts talking about a distress that will be unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. That sounds like he's talking about the, the, the end of the world, um, the, the end of judgment day, right? Right before judgment day. And so Jesus is going back and forth between the end of Jerusalem and the end of the world because he doesn't care if we can tell the two apart. His point is the same either way. His point is, put your trust in me, not in this world or this city. That's why Jesus can easily go back and forth, and he's not so worried that we can parse the future and say, exactly when is this coming true? Exactly how is this coming true? Because he just wants us to know uh, the truth to trust in him. So here's the fourth question for you. What are some similarities between the disciples' relationship to Jerusalem and our relationship to the world around us? So what I'm saying is the disciples had a connection to Jerusalem. And I'm saying that we have a connection to the world around us. What are, 
the same about this relationship and this relationship. There are similarities between the way they felt about Jerusalem and the way we feel about our world. What are the similarities between their relationship to Jerusalem and our relationship to the world around us? Pause, talk with others, and uh, we'll come back with some answers. One has got to be they're temporary. They are temporary. Jerusalem would not last forever, even though God had said so many wonderful things and God had set up Jerusalem as his, his holy city. And our world is temporary. Even though God made it and called it very good and God makes it beautiful and blesses it and he has inhabited this world, it's temporary. It's going to come to an end. So we're in big trouble if we put our hope in it. I suppose that's another similarity. If the disciples would get too attached to the city of Jerusalem or to God's temple in Jerusalem, they would have missed out on Jesus. They would have taken something good that God gave them, a home and a temple, and made it the best thing God gave them. In, in the place of Jesus. And we have the same temptation. We have a good play, thing that God gave us, the world around us and the people in it and the stuff in it and the home in it and the nature in it. That's good things from God, but we can't make that the most important thing, make it more important than Jesus. Another similarity I see is that God, Jesus, commanded the disciples to go into Jerusalem and 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 try to save as many as, he, as they could. Jerusalem was a doomed city, but he didn't forget about it. He said, well, in the meantime, I know you're working on a, on a city with a, its time running out, but while the time runs out, go and preach the gospel there. And he's done the same with our world. He says, I know this world isn't going to last forever. You know this world isn't going to last forever. Its time is running out. But in the meantime, go and preach the gospel. See who you can save in the meantime. Maybe there are more relationships um, or more connections between the two relationships that we're exploring, but uh, those are some thoughts. I'd be love to hear if you guys had some other thoughts. You can drop them in the sign-in at the end of this, of this section. And we'll keep on rolling uh, right on to the end of this section, starting in verse 22. Jesus, again, is talking about the, the end of the world. I mean, he's in the context of talking about Jerusalem, so he's talking about that. But he's also talking about the end of the world. He says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. You notice what that says? How bad this world is. Doesn't God care? Doesn't God know? Jesus says, yeah, he does. And for that reason, he's not going to let it go on as long as it could. Jesus is coming soon. Verse 23, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So Jesus is giving us a warning. See, his, his whole language here is not telling us, you should predict the end of the world or you should do this or that because that way you'll be safe from the tragedies. He's, he's not giving us advice. He's not even giving us uh, a timeline that we can know the end of the world or trivia about the end of the world. He's giving us a warning. I've told you ahead of time. I want you to prepare accordingly. Don't be fooled by the false messiahs. And he goes on into detail. So if anyone tells you, verse 26, if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe him. You know, people do that sometimes. They claim that they've found Jesus, the Messiah has come, and it's in a secret place. It's in some backwoods thing. And uh, Jesus is, 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 not, is not wanting us to be fooled by that. He says, no, verse 27, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible in the west, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. You ever seen that where lightning strikes up in the air and you can see it way out on the east side of town, but you can also see it on the west side of town? He says that's how it will be. It won't be a secret. It won't be uh, back in a hidden room or out in the middle of nowhere. You will know. You won't miss the coming of Jesus. There will be no mistaking the coming of the real Messiah when he comes. It will be like lightning that covers all the heavens in an instant. It will be sudden. It will be obvious. It will be universal. Everyone will be able to see when it happens. And no one will have to say, oh, come over here. It's a secret Messiah. Oh, come over here. So if somebody says that, they're wrong. Don't listen. There's no time to go f speculate about a Messiah. When he comes, you'll know. And it'll be too late if you're not expecting it. 
Jesus says wherever there is a carcass, the, there the vultures will gather uh, because he's saying it's it's just what happens, automatic. And he's saying when I come, people will know it's just how it happens. It's automatic. Continuing on, verse 29, he says immediately after the, the distress of those days, so immediately following what he's describing, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. That's a quote from Isaiah chapter 13 and Isaiah chapter 34. You see, Jesus is not trying to give us all sorts of trivia about the end of the world. Often that's what people are interested in when they talk about the end of the world. They say, well, what was this going to happen? Is this going to happen? How could this happen? What are the physics of this? How could this actually be? Jesus is not interested in that. He just wants us to know that the end of the world will happen just the way the Bible foretold it. He know, Jesus obviously knows about the end of the world, but he's not here to give us trivia. He's here to point us to the scriptures. He's here to point us to faith in him because that's the point of the end of the world. Then will appear, verse 30, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Such a cool image. Jesus says, I am coming in power. You will see Jesus. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And then he says, uh, the angels will gather his elect from the four winds. So the angels will be like harvesters who come to, to gather us in. As Jesus has been uh, laying this out, he has been continually warning us, continually telling us uh, what to expect so that we can wait with composure. We know what's coming. And we know that Jesus will come and he will rescue us. He will save us. Uh, and so in, in the next section, we're actually going to see a, uh, a little illustration of that. Um, so that is the illustration of the fig tree. It says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things you know that it, that is the end, is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is why I said this is one of the toughest uh, parts to interpret in the whole Bible. Jesus says, uh, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And he's that only makes sense if he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, but Jesus is interpreting the destruction of Jerusalem right along with the end of the world. It's at the end of the world that Jesus will descend from heaven and the angels will come out. But it's before the end of Jesus' generation that all people will see Jerusalem fall. He's talking about both in the same paragraph, in the same chapter of the Bible. And he's not so concerned with us being able to p tell them apart. He's concerned with us behaving like we know it's coming. And that's why he teaches us the lesson of the fig tree. He says, when you see a tree and it starts, the, the buds start coming out, you know summer's coming. Maybe you can't tell exactly when, but you know it's coming and so you start getting ready. We do the same in our part of the country with winter, right? When the leaves start falling off the trees, we know winter's coming and we start preparing. Uh, we get the snow blowers out, we get, buy some salts from Menards, whatever we gotta do, because we can tell from the trees what's coming, even if we don't know exactly when. We know it's in God's hands. Jesus says that's exactly like the end of the world. You can tell from what's going on around you what's coming, that Jesus is coming back, that the end of the world is, is coming close. We can't calculate exactly when because that's in God's hands, but we know that it is coming. That allows us to handle things different. We can prepare our hearts for the end of the world, not get caught up in, in that. Can you imagine if you did that with seasons? If uh, it was summer and it was nice out, but then the, the leaves started falling off and you didn't buy a winter coat, you didn't uh, get a snowblower or a shovel, you didn't go get salt because you just figured, well, it's nice out now. Why would I have to worry about winter? It seems pretty nice out now. It's 50 degrees. It's October. We're all good. That would be crazy. You start getting ready for winter 
because you know it's coming, even if you don't know when. Jesus is saying, don't get obsessed with this world. Things are good in this world. Things are bad in this world. But what's coming is, is judgment day. What's coming is Jesus. So, so prepare your heart for it. Prepare for judgment day. That leads me to my fifth question. How does knowing God is coming later affect the way you prepare and live now? I'm asking you to make the application of the seasons changing so you get ready. Make that application to your life with God. You know he is coming. You don't know exactly when, but you know he is coming. That changes the way you live. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you prepare yourself. How? What are some things that change because of what you know is coming? Pause, discuss, and chat. We'll come back with answers. It definitely makes sure that you're not too attached to the things of this world. You don't have to be in love and obsessed with this world because you know God is going to come and destroy this world and give you a better one. It means that you have hope. You're not overwhelmed by the sadness in this world. Yeah, this sadness is real. It hurts for real, just like it really hurts when a woman has a baby, but it's temporary and what's coming is the, is the joy. It means that you're not overwhelmed by the goodness of this world. You're not overwhelmed by the badness of this world. But it also does put a pretty imperative on your time in this world. You need to manage your soul well in this time because God is coming. You can also manage the gospel well, right? Sharing it with people, preaching it to the ends of the earth, just like Jesus said would happen. Preach it to the ends of the earth because you know that our time is short. And so let's let's get after it. Let's get after our own soul care and let's get after our evangelism because the time is, is short and Jesus is coming soon. That's what we've covered so far in this section. We're going to come back with a little transition and then cover the rest of the chapter after this. There you go. There are going to be signs of the end of the world in history, secular history. There are going to be signs in the end of the world in church history. There are going to be signs in the end of the world that make us uh, look up to the heavens and, and remember God's promises and his warnings from the Old Testament. This is all so that we would be alert, be aware, and not be caught unawares when Jesus returns. Uh, it's, like, it's like looking at the trees change in spring or in fall. You know what's coming because you can see what's going on around you. That's what Jesus wants us to be too. In this next section, Jesus gets really specific, really down to brass tacks about what should we do. If we can see in the world around us, in the way things are, if we can see that Jesus is coming soon, as he promised, then how should it affect our lives? That's what we learn in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 51. You're going to see those words on the next screen. There's a video of it below. You can read it online by clicking that link, or you can read it in your paper Bible. Let's dig in and find out exactly what kind of people we ought to be in Matthew 24, 36 to 51. Jesus said that we would be able to see in the history of the world, in the history of the church, how bad things would get. Jesus said that the destruction of Jerusalem would be bad, and he tied the destruction of Jerusalem intimately with the end of the world. Jesus tells us that all those things should get us ready. When you see the seasons changing, you see the fig trees changing, you see the maple tree in your backyard changing, you start getting ready for the next season. And when we see that stuff coming, we should start getting ready. But Jesus wants us to be crystal clear that it won't be shocking when we see God's announcement of his coming. When we see these terrible things, it won't shock everybody. Nobody will be able to predict the hour and the day. That's what he talks about in verse 36. He says, the day and the hour are unknown. So verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the son, but only the father. We should probably make a quick note of this. When Jesus says not nor the son, he's saying he doesn't know about judgment day. And this is where we have a mystery of, of Jesus person. So Jesus is true God. And as true God, he knows everything that the father knows. But Jesus is also true man. And so as true man, he learned things as he grew up. He learned his native language. It took him time to learn how to walk. And he didn't know, as a human, he didn't know 
uh, when Judgment Day would come. But Jesus is still truly human in heaven. So it's not as though once he ascended into heaven, zap, he got the knowledge. And it's not as though he wasn't truly God when he was on earth. So there's no good way to explain this. <coughs> Other than admitting, we can't tell all of the, we can't, you know, plumb all the depths of the mystery of Jesus. He is true God. As true God, he knows everything. He is true man. As true man, he does not know everything. Both are true right now and all the time. I don't understand it. It's a mystery we wait till heaven to unravel. But God does know. The Father in heaven does know the time uh, of Jesus' second coming. It uh, And he knows it. He, he talks about it as though it's going to come out of the blue. Jesus has been giving us all these signs. All of history is pointing to his second coming. All these things alert us that, oh, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And yet it's going to take us by surprise. It's still, it still will. It's going to seem like it comes out of the blue and he compares it to the flood in Noah's day. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, First of all, let's just notice Jesus takes the story of Noah very seriously. He doesn't think it's a legend. He doesn't think it's a poem. He thinks it's history. In the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. What's so crazy about that? It's all normal stuff. It's the stuff people do every day. They eat and drink and get married up to the day Noah entered the ark. Verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Now, why did they not know what was coming? It's not because God didn't tell them. God let Noah preach that message for 120 years and no one listened. That's what's happening in our world. We are preaching that someday Jesus is going to come back. Why will people be caught by surprise? Not because Jesus never told them, because they don't believe when they do hear it. And they don't believe because life seems so normal. People are eating, people are drinking, people are marrying. Things are normal. And Jesus says that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's so normal that it's kind of, it's almost jarring to believe that Jesus someday is just going to show up. His example is in verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. I've heard different people say, what does it mean to be taken or left? Um, of course, there was a left behind series. And there are people who believe that you dispensation, that you just you know evaporate on judgment day. That's not what the Bible teaches. Um, in 2 Thessalonians, um, in in a parts of other parts of, of Matthew here, Jesus teaches that we will all stand before Jesus on this earth and then he will judge everyone. Nobody's zapped straight to heaven. We will all stand judgment before Jesus um, on this earth and then believers will go to heaven and unbelievers will go to hell. So the taking and left is who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Some people say, uh, <clears throat> some people will believe Jesus. They will be taken up into heaven and others will be left on earth and then left for dead in hell. Um, two women grinding at a handmill, one taken to heaven because she believed in Jesus, the other one left for dead in hell. Now, why is that remarkable? Well, it's because they look so much the same. They both woke up that same morning, nothing spectacular. They both went to lunch that afternoon, nothing spectacular. Both the men and the women, both the believer and the unbeliever, they are doing their daily work in the field. They are grinding their normal daily bread. Everything looks normal. And yet out of the blue, Jesus will come just like he said. Let's remember how decisive that day will be. Two men in the same field, two women at the same mill, two guys at the same job, two women working in the same office, two moms watching their kids in their houses, and suddenly the normalness will end and Jesus will be upon us. Why does Jesus tell us all this? So that we stay watchful. That's verse 42. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. It's not like Jesus gives us 24 hours heads up. You don't know. But understand this, a parable. If the owner of a house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So who comes unexpectedly? A thief. Who comes unexpectedly in Jesus' uh, life? The Son of Man. Jesus is saying, I'm like a thief. In what way? 
not like he's going to steal things. He's told us he is the ultimate giver. That's what all of uh, Matthew chapter 5 and 6 was about. So he's not like a thief in his stealing. He's like a thief in his suddenness. Just like a thief doesn't ex uh, explain when he's coming, so also Jesus will not explain when he's coming. You just got to stay ready. And every natural disaster, every tragedy in the church, every child abused, every harmful effect of sin is to remind us that Jesus is coming. It's to remind us that we need to stay watchful because Jesus is going to come and right these wrongs. He's going to end this suffering, and we need to be ready for when he does it. Verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in the household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing good when he returns, doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he is not aware of, he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus says, you and I, all people on earth, we are like the servants in this illustration. So a thief is coming, a master of the house, that would be God the Father. And what will you be up to? Will you be doing your job when the thief comes? If so, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so. And, and God will give you a reward. He will reward you even though you don't deserve anything because of your sins. God will reward you for good labor after he has forgiven all your sins because of Jesus. He says, well done. You were ready for me at the end. I saw you in the terrible meantime of planet Earth when things are horrible and people are getting hurt and abused. I saw you doing well. You managed things well. You were ready for me to come. And then he says, but suppose that servant is wicked. So there are not all good servants. Some are wicked. And they say, my master is away a long time. There is no God is the way that one sounds. So there are no consequences. I can beat people. I can eat and drink with drunkards. I can do what I want with my own life because there is no God. If there were, he would be back by now. Jesus says, people will think that. Maybe you know some people who think like that. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die and there is no consequence. It says the master will come when he doesn't expect it. Just because you don't think there's a God doesn't mean there isn't a God. And then he says, those who are wicked will be assigned a place with the hypocrites. One of Jesus' descriptions of hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Got question number six. What bad outcomes could happen if we get used to normalness of life on earth and forget God. Bad things will happen if we get accustomed to life on earth and we forget about God. Of course, that's the thing Jesus is warning us about. He's warning us things will seem normal. Two people doing the same job, believers and unbelievers working side by side, men at work, women at work, and then all of a sudden, boom. He says bad things will happen if you get used to that normalness. He says, don't forget I'm coming. It's a wicked servant who starts doing his own thing because he thinks his master is never coming back. It's a wicked person who thinks God doesn't exist and so there's no consequences. What can you come up with if you think of what are bad outcomes that happen if we get used to normalness, if we forget about God? Pause, discuss, write some answers down, and we'll come back with some thoughts. The big ultimate one that Jesus points to is, is this one right here. He says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth if we forget about God, do our own thing, don't put our hope in Jesus. He says bad things will happen like you'll go to hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where people who don't believe in Jesus go. But in the meantime, look at these other things. He says the evil servant beats his fellow servants, if you think there are no consequences for your answers, for your actions, um, that's the source of a lot of hatred and, and evil in the world. Now, there are people who will point out, and rightly so, that Christians do their fair share of evil too. And that's true. We should work as hard as we can to reduce our temptation for that. But it doesn't negate the fact. It doesn't negate the fact that believing there's no consequences for your actions does lead you to do evil things. And uh, maybe it means that you're not hurting other people, but you are hurting yourself. You think this world is all there is to live for, so live it up. 
you know, do things irresponsibly, eat and drink. If you get used to this world being the main thing, the normalness here, you could forget about God and, uh, and hurt yourself. I mean, another thing that could, another bad outcome that could happen is if we get so used to life on this earth and the normalness here, we may not have our hearts set on anything in heaven. We may not want to go to heaven if we love earth, or we may lose all hope of heaven uh, because we don't even think it's worth it. We think, oh, life is just tragedy. God is just evil. The world is bad. Everything is bad. God freely admits that this world is bad, that in this world we will have sufferings, but he promises us that he is coming to end those things. We can't forget that. We can't get so used to the good parts of life or the bad parts of life that we forget about God or we'll lose our hope, we'll give in to temptation, we'll hurt others, we'll hurt ourselves, and finally we'll end up in hell. Jesus wants the opposite of that for us. He wants us to fix our hope always on Jesus. Fix our hope always on him because that will allow us to live life the right way here and that will allow us to endure all the evil until the very end when we will be delivered from it. Let's wrap up with a conclusion and one last question. I'll see you on the other side. What do you think? What sort of people ought we be? How should we live if we know Jesus is coming? The one thing we have to say is that it changes your life. It does change your life to know that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. And Jesus wants us not so much to predict the future, not so much to be able to calculate exactly when he's coming, not to say that we have secret knowledge that other people don't, not to elevate us out of this world so that we don't have to deal with the problems in this world. No, Jesus wants us to change the way we interact with each other, with the world, with our own thoughts, with our depression. Jesus wants us to change the way we live because we know our hope is in his sure coming. That's our last question. Question number seven. What sort of people ought we be as we know the world is ending? Pause the video. Rescan the whole chapter, Matthew 24, if you've got a paper Bible with you. Uh, and then jot some notes. Talk to one another. What sort of people ought we be if we know the world is ending and Jesus is coming soon. Just based on the parables that we read at the end of this uh, section, Jesus says we should be vigilant, like people who are waiting for some a thief who might come in the night. Vigilant. If we fall asleep, if we drift from our focus on Jesus, we could get caught surprised. And we will not be excited. We will not be happy about that. Jesus said we ought to be wise, right? We ought to not be uh, foolish, but we should be wise, always knowing um, that, that, that this kingdom is, the Jesus' kingdom is coming in glory soon, just like he said in that last parable. I think we can reach back further and say we can be confident, not uh, dispassionate observers of the entire history of the world, like, oh, this doesn't matter, it's all going to burn up, but, but confident that this is a sign that God is doing his work and that he is coming soon. And finally, we can be hopeful. Hopeful because we have our future lens focused on Jesus. We know that this world does not end in tragedy. The tragedies are just telling us that the end is coming. But the end is not tragedy. We can be vigilant. We can be wise. We can be uh, alert. We can be confident. We can be hopeful. Because Jesus has told us exactly what's going to happen. He said there's going to be hard times, and in the end, he will come. That's the hope of disciples. Next week, we got one last section, verse tw chapter 25, which tells us a little more about what kind of people we ought to be. Some more parables that help us clarify this. But, but for today, I, I'm glad that you watched. I'd love if you'd sign in. You can uh, sign in by clicking the link below. There's a link to sign in where you can uh, leave your name and a question. I'll answer any questions you ask in future videos. Uh, but also you can uh, enter this code in, a, in a, uh, any web browser. It's tinyurl.com slash momatthew24 because this is a study of Matthew 24. Alternatively, you can take your smartphone, scan the image, uh, the little code that's right next to me here, and that will take you to the same page where you can leave your name. 
Thank you so much for joining us today as we studied Matthew chapter 24. I hope you learned something. I hope more than that, that you were encouraged, that you were made more hopeful because you know that Jesus is coming. I'll see you next week as we study Matthew chapter 25. Thank you.